Hello and welcome to another A Nerdy Journey podcast episode, the podcast where we talk to filmmakers about their journeys into the filmmaking industry. I'm your host, A.K. Moore, and my guest today is David Rader, a highly accomplished unscripted writer and producer with over 35 years of entertainment industry experience. David, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to speak with you and to all of your listeners. Well, I know you're busy. You have a show that you're currently working on, and uh, that's always got to be fun when you can actually have a project to be working on that pays the bills. Yes, um, I'm very happy to be working. I, you know, I work in the unscripted um, segment of the entertainment industry, and I have been. It was my first job was in unscripted, and I'm still in unscripted to this for, day. For all of our listeners and or viewers out there. What exactly is unscripted? Well, you know, it used to be called just reality TV is what they called it, you know, but it's like, it's easy to tell you what it's not. It's not a movie. It's not a sitcom. It's not a one hour drama. Mm -hmm. It's documentary style. So, but even reality shows that like, you know, the Kardashians or so on, right. That's considered unscripted. Sure. Um, any documentary you might watch on Netflix is unscripted, even though there's writing involved and there's scripting involved because I was just writing today on my unscripted show. But uh, that's another story we can maybe get into later oh, about yes. why it's called unscripted. By unscripted, it means there's no script, there's no screenplay, you know, mm -hmm. there's no dialogue written. That's why they call it unscripted. But it's documentary, reality, game shows is unscripted. Yeah. In talk shows are unscripted, but I work more in the documentary side of things. I've done uh, TV documentaries is, is how I usually refer to what I do. Well, that is certainly exciting given the wide range of topics you've been able to cover over your 35 plus years uh, in the industry. But let's rewind that and take it back a little bit to the beginning. What was your, uh, shall I call it, inciting incident into the industry? What made you realize that you wanted to go into the entertainment industry? Okay, well, I have to go back to like the original event, which is the first time I went into a movie theater and saw a movie, which was King Kong versus Godzilla in 1964 at a little theater in our hometown. And outside of the theater, they had a cardboard cutout of Godzilla. And, you know, he was probably five or six feet tall, but to me, at, at, you know, as being five years old, it was this giant towering creature. And uh, I can remember I can remember looking up at it. I don't even know where it was in the theater, but he was holding, Godzilla was holding train cars in his hand. And I just remember being awed by this thing and then going in the theater and seeing the King Kong versus Godzilla movie. And even to this day, those kind of monster movies are my favorite kind of movies. I think it just planted a seed in me where anything that takes you to like another place or another land or another journey, I like sci-fi, monster movies, uh, historical epics, anything that takes you to another place are still my favorite kind of movies, but I can owe it all back to that original King Kong versus Godzilla. Um, but movies were huge for me all during my childhood, especially monster movies. They were playing a lot of those on TV at the time, a lot of the movies from the 50s, those mm. sci-fi black and white giant spider movies and stuff. And those were just my favorite. I just love that kind of stuff. And then, of course, I was a teenager in the 70s when we reach the amazing run of, you know, Spielberg and Lucas and Jaws and The Exorcist and Star Wars. And um, that's when I really started thinking, oh, you can make movies. You can, this can be something you can actually do. Um, and that led to me making my first movie, my own, it was in the late seventies that I started making my own little, little features myself. Did you make them on Super 8? I did make them on Super 8. The minute I discovered that my friend Karen Wagner's father had a Super 8 camera, I went, get that camera, <laughs> get it. We're making a movie. And, you know, we were like punkers and new wavers at that time. You know, we were artsy people mm -hmm. and so i made a movie my first movie was called my friends and i just had all of my friends in their punk and new wave attire 
doing ridiculous, crazy things on camera. And then I just edited them together into like a montage of just my friends doing weird stuff. And that was my first movie. But, you know, that led to a second and a third and a fourth, all on Super 8. And I cut them on the, those little reel-to-reel with the tape. I don't know if you've ever, did you ever work in Super 8? Maybe? I have never worked in Super 8, but uh, we did have, uh, I did have friends in college who did stuff on 16. That's the closest I got. Okay. Because, you know, you, you splice it together with yes. tape mm-hmm. and you see the tape every time it goes through the, the projector. Mm-hmm. And every t- you know, and you don't make, you don't make a, a dub of it. You play the same film over and over and over again. So every time you, you project it, it gets ruined more and more and more. But uh, gotta love make, analog mediums. That's well, you know, that's exactly what it was. And, um, you know, I rarely did more than one take of anything. It was like <laughs> I tried to have it all be edited in camera, you know, but it still required, you know, cutting. And I still remember like I still remember going to the processing place. They had to send it off to Kodak up in Rochester. I, lived, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they, they had to send the film off to Rochester and then it would come back. So it would take like a week. And I just remember coming home and like sitting down at the dining room table in my parents' house and putting it on and looking at the little view screen. It was only about that big, you know, yeah. like, oh, it looks so cool. And like cutting it and slipping it together. I mean, it was, it was just amazing, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, um, in I started. Uh, I went to I, I uh, um, went to photography school. I didn't go to film school. I went. I wanted to be a photographer. Okay. And so, yeah, I went so to the what, artist. You, you grew up wanting. You grew up loving these monster movies, and you decided to go to photography school. What made you decide to do that rather than a film right. school or something else? Film school really didn't exist in the 70s. I know it did, but it didn't exist like in the popular consciousness, like mm-hmm. the idea that one could go to college for filmmaking. It felt, to me, it was something, it was a creative endeavor, like being an artist, right? Mm-hmm. You don't go to school to be an artist. Well, I guess you can, but you don't yeah. go to college. <laughs> you don't go to college to be an artist. You might go to an art school, right? Yeah. So they, just the idea, it just never even it just wasn't, I knew that George Lucas had gone to USC. That was such a known thing in the seventies after star Wars came out. Yeah. That he went to USC and there was a USC film school. But, you know, I was in Pittsburgh. That was in LA. That could have been Mars for all I knew. Right. Sure. It just wasn't, it just wasn't a thing, but I've always been the type of person that I just followed my creative impulses without even thinking, can I make a living at this? Like I didn't think when I was making those movies, like, Oh, I'm going to, this is going to be my career. I thought you work at a job mm-hmm. and you make money at your job and then you use the money you make at your job to make your, your movies. It never occurred to me that making, you know, what we would call today media or content yeah. could be a job. That just wasn't even a thing. Um, but I liked images, right? I liked, that's why I got into photography. Um, and it was a movie that got me into photography, a movie called, um, the Eyes of Laura Mars, directed by Irving Kirshner, who directed The Empire Strikes Back in 1980. But in 1978, it was a movie about a photographer, a thriller, and I'm like, I want to be a photographer. I'm just going to go there and do that. So I went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh and uh, studied photography. But I only went for like a semester and a half, and I put together a portfolio. And I'm like, I'm out of here. And I moved to San Francisco. Um, uh, I wanted to live in a, in a more creative city. A lot of people from Pittsburgh go to New York Mm -hmm. and I went on the other side because I'd visited San Francisco on vacation and I loved it. So I'm like, I'm moving to San Francisco. That's where I'm going. So I ended up moving to San Francisco um, to be a photographer in the early eighties. And did you actually start to become a photographer when you moved there or uh, what, what did you start to do once you initially moved? I got a job right away being a photographer in San Francisco. I worked for a studio called Mulan Studios. And it was run by a, a guy whose great grandfather had photographed the San Francisco earthquake in 1906. And then his father was a photographer. And now he was the, the third in the line of, of photographers. And um, we used high end Hasselblad cameras, which are the same cameras they took to the moon. Yep. I am and very jealous of you saying that. The, I've always <laughs> wanted a Hasselblad. <laughs> yeah, with the big square um, negatives were this big, mm-hmm. right? And um, they would send me out on jobs. I, I, I became mainly a architectural photographer with them, mm-hmm. where I would go photograph buildings. Um, and um, so I got to go into like the roofs, rooftops of buildings and the basements of buildings and all kind of very interesting places. 
um, because I was an architectural photographer. I did some events like um, parties or weddings. I did a few weddings, but it was mostly architecture. And then I also processed the film and printed the pictures at the studio. We had a full processing lab there. And so I immediately got a job doing that in San Francisco. And actually, I worked in that field uh, for the seven years that I spent in San Francisco before I decided to do the thing that you're asking me about, which was well, getting in the entertainment industry. Well, the, going into <laughs> photography isn't necessarily dissimilar from what we do. It is, I feel like, a, a it is partially attached to the entertainment industry for sure. Uh, what made you what what made you decide to say you know what i've had i've done my time with photography it's time to finally fulfill my true passion of working in entertainment right well i met uh this person who was highly uh influential in my life named kelly kozak and she was the keyboard player in an all-girl punk band in san francisco and i was making a movie and i wanted her to do the soundtrack to my movie and I saw her walking by the laundromat. I was doing my laundry and I knew she lived in my neighborhood. And I saw her walk by and I ran out. And I was like, you're the keyboard player for Varv. That was her band, Varv, right? And she said, yeah. And I'm like, I'm doing a 16 millimeter movie and I need someone to do my soundtrack. Will you do it? And she said, yes, immediately. She said, yes. We became immediate friends. Um, I won't go into all the crazy exploits we got into in San Francisco in the early 80s, but spray paint and graffiti was involved. We were street artists, outlaw street artists at the time. And, you know, I was a filmmaker. She was in an all-girl punk band. You know, it doesn't get more early 80s San Francisco than that. <laughs> but she and her partner in the late 80s said, we're moving to L.A. to get in the entertainment industry. And we think you should come too. And it took me like two years to like get wrap my mind around that concept and get it together. But in 1987, they, they came down here and they both immediately got jobs in the entertainment industry. Um, and I was like, I, you know, to me, it was a pipe dream. Like, oh, yeah, you're just going to go to L.A. and like get jobs. Right. Yeah. They immediately, they immediately got jobs in the entertainment industry, both of them. And they were like, you need to come down. You need to come down. So in um, August of 1987, I relocated to L.A. and I I bought an old computer off of the place I was working. They were, they were upgrading their computers. And that was going to be the computer I was going to write my first screenplay on. I wanted to be a screenwriter when I came here. Because I thought, that's the way to get into movies. You write a script that everybody wants. You know, this was the late 80s when the spec script market was off the hook. You know, mm -hmm. um, Sh uh, Shane Black had sold um, Lethal Weapon for a million dollars, right? And it was after there was a writer's strike in the 80s. And the minute that strike was over, it was a feeding frenzy of people wanting to like buy, of the, of the uh, studios wanting to buy scripts, right? Mm -hmm. So I arrived in LA at the height of like a, you know, million dollar, several hundred thousand dollar feeding frenzy for scripts. Mm -hmm. And I brought this Mac computer that you needed to use the big giant floppy disks to put in to boot up Word. Yep. And you had to put in another disk in order to like save you can only save like 20 pages of your script at a time. Wow. Yeah, that was it. So I had like five or six floppy disks that had my script on it. Then I had one of those daisy wheel printers. I went tap, 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 tap. It took, it took like five minutes a page to type out my script. And it was on that paper with the, you, you pull the tabs off yep. the side. You know yeah. what I mean? I but had one of those growing up. Yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. This was the late 80s. Anyway, that was my computer, and I started writing a, um, a script about um, a serial killer called Perfect Prey. And it was about a serial killer, right? Mm -hmm. And I, had, I got a job immediately working at a high-end photo lab in Burbank that had clients like Disney and the Motion Picture Academy. So I felt like I was already like motion picture adjacent because I was seeing like Disney Imagineering art before – it was ever, you know, anyone knew what they were working on. I was seeing sketches for Splash Mountain and, and um, you know, all the Tokyo Disneyland, all that stuff. I was seeing that. And also for the Academy, I got to see a lot of stuff. So I felt like already, like, I was getting, you know, I was industry adjacent at that time. Yeah. And I'll never forget the day that my life changed. I was sitting at my desk and, you know, we had a phone on the desk. There were no cell phones and it rang. And I, hello, this is David at Color House. How can I help you? 
and it was my friend Kelly, who was the keyboard player in the yeah. bar. She, at the time, she was working to, for a producer at Orion Pictures, who oh, had just wow. made RoboCop at that time. So that was, you know, I love that movie. And Orion, to me, was, they also, yeah, it was amazing. Orion Pictures, she was the assistant to a producer, and I'll never forget it. So referring on, hi, David, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, can you live on $250 a week? And she said to me. And I didn't even do the math of how much I was making at this job. And I went, yes. I knew <laughs> what she was going to say. She goes, you need to get your resume over to Mark E. Dale at this TV show called Unsolved Mysteries. I'm like, what's, what's Unsolved Mysteries? I don't know, she says. But it's some show, and they're looking, he needs, he's getting promoted, and he needs to replace himself. So get your resume over. So... I didn't really have a, I didn't have a resume. I had my, my films I made, yeah. which I put on there, right? And I lied. I put on that I was a production assistant at Colossal Pictures up in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I worked for them. They had done uh, um, uh, The Right Stuff. Oh, you know yeah, that movie? very familiar. Philip Hoffman's The Right yeah. Stuff about the Mercury 7 astronauts. Yes. I just put that on there. I lied. I just, I lied, you know? And um, because I had to put something on there, mm -hmm. right? But this was my master stroke is I'm like, how can I make this resume stand out from all the other resumes that, that Mark E. Dale is going to be getting on his desk? Mm -hmm. So I went to the Kinko's copy place. You remember them, Kinko's? I They're very much remember Kinko's, yep. yeah. And I looked at their stationery, and they had it stationery in all these different colors. And at that time, in the late 80s, the color mauve or mauve was a very popular color, like a dusty pink, right? Dusty yeah. rose. I printed my resume out on dusty rose paper. And I was quite proud of myself and thought I was quite savvy. And I drove it over to the Unsolved Mysteries offices, which were on Barham and Kawanga, right by Universal mm -hmm. City, right? Met this Marky Dale character, and he's thank you, da da da. And a couple of days later, I got a phone call to go in for an interview. And I met uh, the uh, one of the producers of the show, and what I told him was, I, I, I had found out that, it, that, the, that the show had done, in addition to Bigfoot and UFO and things yeah. like that, that it did, a, it did crime stories, right? So I knew that, that there was a crime element. And at that point, I was working on a screenplay about a serial killer, and I was obsessed with serial killers. I had read all the books about the Hillside Stranglers and Manson and the Zodiac, right? Yeah. I told the producer, this, and this was, again, another thing that got me the job. I said, I would do this job for free. I'm so interested in this subject matter, right, mm -hmm. that I would do this job for free. Well, you know what the job was? It was being the research assistant. We had, the show had researchers, 15 researchers, which today would be called segment producers. Okay. And it was their job to find stories for the show. Well, this was before the internet. So the research producer would have to go to the library and, um, find books and magazine articles and print them out and um, microfiche. I was about ready to ask if that's what oh, you yeah. had to look for. Yeah. So every um, that, that's what the job was, a research assistant. So I told him, I said, I would do this job for free. I, I, I love this, this, this subject so much. And um, that I would, you know, and I got the job. And I found, I only found out later, this producer and I became friends. And he told me, he said, your resume was shit, but... <laughs> But I got a good vibe from you. Oh, I got to tell the most important part about the mauve. Mm -hmm. Marky e. Dale told me, I put your resume on top because it was mauve. He told me that. He said, I put you on the top of the heap and said, I think you should hire this guy. So when the producer who eventually hired me got the stack of resumes, I was on top and I was mauve. And that's, so that was a, a wise choice. And, you know, it was done not, not just to be different, but to say, this guy's creative. This guy's thinking out of the box, right? That's all I had to sell at that point. I had no... It's creative, but you're also showing that you're willing to go out of your way to make something better. I never thought of it that way, but I think you've, you've nailed something. Unfortunately, that. that doesn't really matter as much because you don't physically mail in resumes anymore. Uh, <laughs> so all of us have crazy <laughs> different designs for our resumes that we try to do. But you know what? I have actually never gotten a job in this industry from my resume. It's a people industry. Mm -hmm. I think you know that. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. 
You know, people want to, it's hot, it's, it's um, high stress. So people want to work with smart, good, friendly people. Yeah. And I mean, what you, know? you just said, he got a good vibe from you. Uh, doesn't matter if your said. resume was shit. If they like you, right. you're going to get the job. That, my move got me on the top. And yeah. then my energy, my, mm -hmm. I don't think I said to him, I would do the job for free, but I would have, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I was so in awe of the entertainment industry then that any job would have been good for me. Seriously. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't even matter. When I moved to LA, I couldn't believe you could drive right up to the gate of a studio. You know what I mean? Seriously, I was yeah. like, I'd drive by Warner Brothers in Burbank and be like, I would hear like choirs singing, right? Or by Paramount, yeah. you know? And like, ah, like, it was just amazing to me. But the, like, it was. And you were next to the slew of other people who are also doing the same thing? Well, you know, everyone comes here with a dream, right? You did. Oh, you know? absolutely. And yeah, everybody comes here with a dream. But I just couldn't believe that you could just drive right up to the gate. You know, it was amazing to me. It was just, it felt like it was right there, like right behind those walls, right? Yeah. Was the movie. Because, so anyway, I, I got the job. And what happened with Unsolved Mysteries was it became a huge hit TV show. It wasn't even on the air as a series when I started on it. But okay. it, it immediately became a giant hit. And if you've ever worked on a TV show or anything, I guess a TV show, yeah, that no one knows if it's going to be a hit and then becomes a hit is they staff up a lot. Like, Oh, we need more of everything. Mm -hmm. Right. So they needed more researchers. Yeah. Right. And while I was out, look, uh, being the, I got the job as the research assistant. Right. Yeah. Um, while I was out getting things for the researchers, I started finding my own stories. Right. So I said to my boss, can I pitch a story at the story meeting? And they were like, sure. And I remember it was called Skeleton Canyon. It was a treasure story from Arizona, right? And um, I wrote it up. And because I was, saw myself as a writer at that point, I was writing a screenplay. Mm -hmm. I did a really good write-up, you know? Um, and the story meetings were, there were about 15 researchers and the executive producers, Terry Muir and John Cosgrove were in the room. Mm -hmm. And each researcher would pitch their story. And then they would say, oh, we don't like it or do more research or we like that, put that on the front burner. Right. And I, my first story got chosen to be done. Wow. And yep. Yeah, Skeleton Canyon got chosen. And, um, eventually I had to replace myself just like Marky e. Dale had to replace himself. Right. So what I did became, you, what did you move up to? What was that? To research, to researcher at the okay. time. And that paid $500 a week. And I was like, I can't believe I'm making $500 a week. That just seemed like, a ridiculous amount of money in 1988, right? Like a, ridiculous. I was probably the research the, uh, assistant for maybe six or seven months before I moved up to a, a full-on researcher. That's a you know? feel like a pretty short turnaround time, but I guess that goes to you always wanted to progress up the ladder. Okay, well, let me tell you what I did and, and the way that I operated. Because this, if you, people are looking for a way to get ahead. Yeah, please. For, the first piece of advice I give you is... How are you different from every other, other person, right? Mm -hmm. I did Move stationary. Find something unique about yourself to sell yourself that will separate you from everybody else. I'm going to get a t-shirt printed out that says, find your Move stationary. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that's a, I think that's a good idea. I, I, I see it becoming a viral meme. Uh, it, it might as well, as far as I'm concerned. And I, you're obviously going to have to get the first version of that. Okay, I think it's a good idea. But yes, tip number one, find your, uh, is it find Mov or Mov? Stationary. Is it Mov or Mov? Okay, I'll let everybody correct us. Anyway, nuts. what's tip number two, David? Tip number two, whatever job they give you, no matter how demeaning, do it 10 times better than anybody else would ever do that job and with a smile on your face, right? Mm -hmm. Xeroxing, correlating, whatever it is. Sure, I'll do that. No problem, right? Because... When it comes time to get a promotion, they ask other people, how's David doing as that research assistant? Oh, he's amazing. I ask him for three things and he brings me five, right? I ask him to do, to, to do Xeroxing and he collates everything and staples it and puts it all, you know, like that's how you get ahead, right? Because mm -hmm. they'll ask other people, how's so-and-so doing? How's so, so if you're like entitled and come in there and like, I'm a writer and they're having me get coffee, be the best coffee getter they've ever had and they'll be like oh this guy he's we need to give him or this girl we need to give them something else they're 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 
you know, they've got smarts, they're they're driven, they're ambitious. We we have to give them something else, right? I have so the my... worst coffee story. Uh, uh -oh. Did, were you a coffee getter at one point? Uh, so my first internship out here uh, in LA, I'm not going to say where it was at. The company was fantastic. It was a smaller production company. Um, but the one of the main uh, people there, he was like the first AD on all their sets. And I, I'm pretty sure he was also the line producer at the company or one of them. I'm uh, drawing an exact blank. But he always told me the wrong coffee to get him. And then he'd get mad when it wasn't right. <sighs> And so, like the first time, I the, and he was he was an older man. He was very sweet, but he got frustrated very quickly. And I was kind of scared of him, <laughs> uh, you know. I Florida boy coming out to L.A. for the summer to intern. You know, you didn't want to screw that up. Understood. Especially, yeah. yeah, especially on your first internship. And so I remember the first time I got his coffee, I thought I just remembered it wrong or I wrote it down wrong. So the second time I had him or the. I, that happened twice where I gave it to him and he's like, this isn't right. So the, the third or the fourth time, I'm like, I'm going to have him text me what he wants. <gasps> so I had him text me and then I bring it to him. He's like, this isn't right. And I'm like, well, what the fuck am I supposed to do? What do you mean it's not right? He's like, oh, uh, this was, uh, I don't even remember, but it was something along the lines of, this is a mocha I wanted a lot to. And I'm like, but you wrote mocha. <laughs> Um, what did and, he say? Did he did he fess to it or no? No, I just it was a consistent thing where every single day that I would he would ask for coffee, it would be the wrong thing because he would say one thing and mean another or something along those lines. So his coffee was just never right the entire two and a half months I was at this internship, and I just I felt like an idiot every day. It was my least favorite thing, but I tried to be a good coffee getter. Everybody else's was fine, but this one guy was always wrong. When I moved to L.A., somebody told me that you're going to be treated like shit in this business. And it's almost like a hazing thing that you're going through to get into a fraternity. Oh, right? absolutely. That working in the entertainment industry is such a, a stressful and hard thing to do that they have to weed out. Mm -hmm. That's what I was told, right? Yeah. Weed out the people. But that brings me to one of my personal tenets that I, I, I'm still living by to this day. Yeah. And that is... I have a no asshole world. My self-respect is worth more than any job or paycheck that I'm getting. And if I ever feel that somebody is treating me less than in any way, shape, or form, I call them on it. And if I need to, I will walk out the door and I will quit. And I will tell them exactly why. I won't lie and be like, oh, my mother got sick and I have to go home. Like I'll, I'll be like, you treated me bad. And I've only had to do it once or twice in this business to really call someone on the right? Mm -hmm. But because I was reading this book about, I think it, it was either Peter Gerber or John Peters, one of these big movie producers from the 80s or 90s, right? Uh -huh. And there was a story about him leaping across a table and grabbing a, a, an executive by his tie and strangling him at a meeting. And that, I remember reading that, and I'm like, I have a, uh, that's never going to happen. If anyone does that to me, I'm not, no job is worth, is worth my self respect. It's just not. You know, the film at the end of the day, that's all you really have is your self-respect. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you're alone at night and whatever, you know, that's all you have. So I was like, there, so that, that I wasn't going to talk about that on here. But since you brought up your your yeah. your story, that's one of my and I know you were an intern. And you really couldn't do much about it. I get no. that. I'm not saying that you yeah. should have done that because a lot of people put up with it and they rise up and they, they do fine. But I would bet you those people end up abusing other people in the same way. I'm sure they do. And yeah, yeah. there's no. To me, there's no justification for that for in any industry whatsoever. And you're right. It does feel like a little bit of college hazing. I think the most that I experienced it, not necessarily him. I think he was just forgetful and didn't exactly know what he wanted. I don't think there was any malice there. But my first proper set in L.A., it was for a Hulu show. I'm not going to name the show. Um, but the unit production manager on it, uh, the first two days on this job would just completely uh either make fun of me or berate me for ridiculous things that i should have never even been expected to know but i the thing that i directly remember is um uh the onset surveillance that you get right i it was my first set. Onset surveillance oh, so, uh, you your um your walkie and the surveillance headset that you have um, they, call that, a, they, they call, call that a surveillance i don't even know that term this it's is called, new to me. it's called surveillance uh -huh. uh, and i it was my first set and I was not told that they don't give it to you. <laughs> um, so there are some sets that give it to you, 
but the bigger like TV shows and stuff don't normally give it to you and they don't normally have extras. So I uh, show up to set no, and I don't have surveillance from my walkie. So what they they gave me what they call the Burger King. It's the big headset with the microphone that you put down. And <laughs> he would, every single time I would walk by the UPM, he would make fun of me for not having proper surveillance. Um, and then he would also just have me do the most asinine, ridiculous tasks or give me multiple things to do at once and then yell at me when I wasn't back quick enough. Like it was very clearly him hazing the new guy. And it's just, it it's not fun and it's not right like it i fully agree with you you're not the first person who i've said who you have a no asshole policy and i fully agree it's a it's stressful but can it also be fun to work in this industry and i'd rather work with the fun people well you know they this industry kind of counts on people wanting to work in it so badly mm -hmm. that they'll put up with oh. all the bullshit yeah that's what they count on which by bullshit i also mean working crazy hours get you know driving it extreme distances oh, after yeah. a rat, like all those things, right? They just know that people want to work in this industry. Maybe that's changing now. I think I think it's there not. seems to be a trend. You don't think so? I think there's more of a trend of the balance in my life is more important than like I, I can still giving tell you. too much to a job. But you're telling me that's not the case. No, no, I'm not saying yeah. they don't still do that to people. Mm -hmm. I think there's what, the younger people these days are are less likely to put up with it. Is, is my point. Do you agree or disagree? I agree that uh, we are less likely to put up with it, but I also just know of so many sets where my friends have done, you know, fifteen to eighteen hour days consistently and uh no or horrible turnaround times because obviously PAs don't have official turnaround I meant um mandatory turnaround times like everybody else does so it is i still hear about my friends getting abused on sets in terms of just long hours horrible turnaround times and you know we need money unfortunately sometimes and there's not you can't always count on there being another thing but mm -hmm. i'm i do hope that uh people in my generation the generation behind uh, me and the generation slightly ahead of me are starting to become less assholeist because we're just tired of putting up with it mm -hmm. i hope that but well, there's I no re there's no reason for it is the is the there is just no reason no. for it and I just you know there's been a lot of pushback since the Me Too yeah with a lot of people that are just being called out for being bullies now right yeah. not just being sexist or whatever or but being bullies right there's just no reason for it no. you can still and you'll get more out of people you will you people... know there's that thing you get more out of you know flies from you draw more flies with honey than vinegar right yeah it's just it has nothing to do with the work. It has nothing to do with the art. It has everything to do with the insecure ego of the person who's belittling you. Sure. You know, and I hope I hope that it all gets you know. You know, I guess yeah. uh, jo uh, what's his name? Joss Whedon is that his name? Joss, wait, who are you talking about? Or are, are you um, talking about Joss? the Avengers? Yes. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yes. What's his name? Joss Whedon. Yeah. Yeah, him. Yeah. Like, he was just an asshole on set. So cancel him. Right, like we don't need you don't need that, yeah. you know. We don't need it. Steven Spielberg isn't an asshole, and he makes all these amazing movies. So, yeah. Right. So why do you need to be an asshole if you can, you know? Yeah. He can make Jurassic Park, right? Why do you need to be an asshole, and you know, for whatever you're making? So anyway, yeah. uh, okay, I derailed us. Um, there yeah, are a little I bit. Wanna, so because there's another. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna yeah. say no. I derailed us. Let's go back to your tips. So, uh, obviously, which one? Uh, you do everything. To the most extreme manner possible, because that's how you'll get promoted. Yes, that was tip right? number two. They know that even like if they tell you you need to be at your desk at, at nine, mm -hmm. be there at eight forty. They'll see you when they come in and see you at your desk every day. They're going to be like, "That's someone I can count on. That's someone who's committed to their job." Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's part Absolutely. of that. Absolutely, that's part of that. Yeah, um, but. Uh, I want to talk about uh, how I, uh, the next phase of my career. Yes. I was on Unsolved Mysteries for seven years. Mm -hmm. That was my film school, right? Okay. I didn't go to film school. Unsolved Mysteries was my film school. That's how I learned to make, excuse me, make television was a Unsolved Mysteries. What did you, what did you end Unsolved Mysteries with? What well, title that's did what you I wanna, Yeah. That's what I was saying. Um, my mother sent me a newspaper clipping. She said, this just happened in our hometown. Maybe you can do an unsolved mystery story about it. And it was about this church, this where they were praying on Good Friday in this church. Mm -hmm. And the people there claimed that the 
Jesus on the cross that was in the church, a life-size Jesus, that Jesus opened his eyes, that they were closed on the cross, and that Jesus opened his eyes, and that there was a, a miracle, a good, a good Friday miracle, right, while they were all praying. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, I don't know, would we do this on Unsolved Mysteries? So I pitched it, and they picked it and said, yes, we'll do this story. And they called me in the office and said, do you want to produce it? Because it's your hometown, right? Uh -huh. And you can probably get, like, hometown advantage. Doors will open for you because it's your hometown, yep. right? And also I knew that they wanted, they didn't want to pay somebody producer rate. They wanted to pay them researcher rate, uh -huh. right? Of course. So, well, that's a true thing, right? Oh, yeah. Like, you know. Um, and I said, yes, I want to produce it. So they paired me with a director. We had, in, in Unscripted, they usually call the directors field producers, is what they call them, mm -hmm. right? Because directors is seen as something in, in movies and, tele, and you know, sitcoms and, and dramas. You have a director on set. So right. in Unscripted, they call them field producers. But... On Unsolved Mysteries, because they did elaborate recreations, mm -hmm. you had a producer, a film producer, which is what they wanted me to be, then you had the director. So it was like working on a small film. And it involved casting, because there were recreations, it involved location scouting and SAG contracts and sometimes set design. And, um, you know, they were like making little movies, you know, and I started doing that on Unsolved Mysteries, being a film producer. And some of the segments that I produced were period recreations. Some of them had special effects. Mm -hmm. uh, we filmed in the Arizona desert where we had stuck people like uh, falling down cliffs. And, you know, I mean, it was, it, they were like little mini movies. They were shot on film at the time, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, it was my job to hire caterers and feed everybody and find a place to put the tables where everything wouldn't blow away and under a tent. So everybody would you know, there's a oh, lot, yeah. you know, you've done it, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, all the logistics that go into producing something, mm -hmm. right? So I was responsible for that on Unsolved Mysteries. And um, uh, that became my next job that I did on that show. And the show was, was super popular in its time. I remember one time we were like the, uh, in the top five, I we were number three for the week, which was amazing because, you know, it's just, you know, you would see friends and, you know, Jerry Seinfeld and then Unsolved Mysteries. And just to think that I was working on this show that was like... Right next to Seinfeld. Yeah. The ratings. Yeah, yeah. They gave us Unsolved Mysteries jackets for Christmas one year. And people used to ask for my autograph because I worked on Unsolved Mysteries. It was that popular. That's awesome. You know? Yeah, it was amazing. And for my first job, right? My first job. Yeah. So it was really, really incredible. Um, but, and this is important, by the mid-90s, I started getting itchy. I'm like, I need to do something else. I wanted, I came to LA to be creative, right? I want to become a, a creative person. So I asked them at Unsolved Mysteries if I could write, if I could write a segment. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, they said, we're Writers Guild. And we have, there's people in front of you who've asked and there, there's just no way you're ever going to get the chance to write a segment on Unsolved Mysteries. So guess what I did? You quit. I quit. <laughs> I didn't do it in a half. I didn't be like, fine. I didn't throw a computer across the room. Mm -hmm. I just made the choice that in order that I need to leap into the unknown to make this next phase of my career happen. So I quit Unsolved Mysteries. They did agree that if they had an occasional film producing gig that I could be brought in freelance, right? Okay. To make ends meet. Nice. That's yeah. always helpful. So, you know, I was like, well, you know, they couldn't say, I'm telling them I'm leaving to become a screenwriter. So they couldn't be like, you jerk. Yeah. <laughs> How yeah. dare you? <laughs> you know, it's not like I'm moving on to the competition, you know? Yeah. So they were, it was, they were very generous and they, you know, they, they got it, you know? And, and you'd you know, been there for, you said eight years? Seven, seven, seven and a half years when I, when I did this, it was like 96 or 97. I think it was, I started in 80, 88, I got the job. So wow. it was late, late. Yeah. Yeah, so if you spent um, that long with somebody, of course, they'd say, like, yeah, you can come back. As, as yeah, as you know, and I know some people, you know, I was ambitious. What could I say? Like, I wanted more. I wanted more. And I wanted to be creative. That was the most important thing. Nothing I was doing on Unsolved Mysteries at that time was creative. And I wanted to be, you know, I was a photographer. That's a creative thing. Yeah. You know, I want to do something creative. So I quit and I started writing screenplays. I just would stay home and I got final draft for my little Mac MacBook 
a little gray plastic computer with the black and white screen, about uh-huh. that big, you know. And I started writing screenplays, and um, I got, uh, I wrote, my first film was a big, like, sci-fi thriller with UFOs and aliens and stuff in it. And um, I got to read the coverage on that, and I also got James Cameron's development person to read it. I, I pestered her <laughs> so much. She was very nice. She sent me a letter back saying, I'm really sorry, but I can't. This was before email. Right? Yeah. I really can't. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I can't read your screenplay. Right. Mm-hmm. But I sent her another thing back and she eventually relented. And so I got to re- hear her coverage of my, my screenplay, which she said that it had spectacular action sequences in it. But my finale, which involved Air Force One, <laughs> she goes, if you knew how many scripts we get across here that have an Air Force One finale, you would never put an Air Force One finale, action adventure finale in your script. Jeez. Right? Yeah. Um, and I also got to read my coverage from William Morris because I knew someone who knew someone who worked there. No, I knew someone who had an agent there. Got it. And so he said, submit this and let, and that was hard to read because you're getting unvarnished. Oh, yeah. Unvarnished. Um, and that said, writer shows promise in what must be a first or second script. Is what, and it was my first. So wow. if they thought it might be a second script, then I'm already ahead of the game. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah. So <laughs> I ended up writing three screenplays, and the third one got optioned by a company called Sneak Preview Entertainment. And I entered development hell. And I think we all know what that means. It's like, they, we love your screenplay. We love it. You're an amazing writer. Yep. Now we want to change everything. Mm-hmm. Can we change it to this, to that? Does the lead character have to be that? Why can't they be this? And it did go to Bette Midler at a certain point for the lead. So that's my, my claim to fame is the script I wrote did go to Bette Midler and Bette Midler wrote it. But she said that the, the lead female character wasn't the lead character of the movie, so she wasn't comfortable doing it. She didn't want to be the second banana. Mm-hmm. She would have been a supporting role in it, even though her character is the one that has the arc over the, over the course of the script. She felt that she, it was upstaged by the, the male character. It was a road movie with two people in a car together, a okay. very common you know, style of movie, right? Yeah. And she felt that the, the guy that she was in the car with had the bigger part and the more glossy part, so she said no. But um, I eventually walked away from that deal when they told me that because I felt like I'm never going to appease these people. They're never going to be happy. Every time they tell me we want this and I give them that, they were like, we want to do something else. And at a certain point, I literally said, to them, I can't take this. I was just burned out. I said, I, I can't take this. I can imagine so, that's really frustrating. Yeah. At a certain point, you, you just need to move on. Yeah, it was around 2000 this, that, that happened, right? So yeah. it was mid-90s when I quit Unsolved Mysteries and started writing. But the other side of that coin is when I started calling myself, and this is the third, the fourth thing that's going to be on my list, right? Okay. Is the minute you start telling people you're a writer, you're a writer. Make sure you're writing. <laughs> Don't just say it. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you tell people you're a writer and you're actually writing, then you are a writer because you're writing, right? Yeah. You might not. It's like if you're an author, you know, I'd be a published author. But if you're writing, you're an author, right? Yep. I just started telling people, I quit on Solved Mysteries after seven years. I'm a writer now. Like, I just put myself out there, you know? And one day I get this phone call from someone and said, friends of mine just sold a show to um, HGTV, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. When that was like a, a, a newer thing back in, in, the, in the 90s. And they're looking for writers. Are you interested? And I was like, yeah. Right? So I get this phone call, like, come in for a meeting, Right? I'm like, I have no writing credits except for my screenplays. That doesn't show I can write a TV show. Yeah. Okay? Well, um, the company was called Pie Town Productions, and they're still around. They do House Hunters, which is a huge show. They developed that and launched House Hunters, which is in episode 365 million. They've been doing so many of those. <laughs> Did you work on any? Um, it wasn't That wasn't on the air back in the late Okay. Uh, I did go back there and work on some in 2017 or 2018, but that this was, I'm talking now back 1997. Okay, got right? it. And it was a show about international travel, right? Mm-hmm. So I went in for this interview, 
And there were three writers sitting on the couch and the two executive producers were sitting across from me. And they told us what the show was and everything and how it was going to go. And then when they were done, they were like, anybody have any questions? And nobody really said anything. And they're like, okay, here you go. And they handed each of us a cardboard box. I'll never forget it. A cardboard box about this big. Like it was probably from beta tapes, right? Yeah. With a bunch of VHS tapes in it and a bunch of research all curled up on paper and stuck in the end. And like, here's your show. Here's your show. And here's your show. Like, you know, we'd like to see, we'd like to see a, a, you know, a draft in two weeks or whatever. And off, and I couldn't believe it. I was like, they didn't even ask me, what have I written? They didn't even ask, like, we looked at your resume. You've got, they didn't, they just, they somehow bought it that I was a writer. Right. And I, uh, AK, I swear to God, I ran to my car. I was afraid I was going to hear them go, wait, we made a mistake. We made a mistake. Like I thought, if I had the tapes yeah. and the research, oh, that's my that's my my segment. Right? Yeah, and I drove away and I called a friend of mine who who had already been a writer and said, "I don't know what I'm doing." He's like, He's, "Okay, I'll I'll talk you through it." Da, 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 da. Well, I did my first episode for them. It was a thirty minute long episode, and it was writing voiceover narration, uh-huh. right? And then you'd have to transcribe what the people were saying on the show because there were no transcripts. You know, like you have to Got sit it. there. With VHS, like stop and starting, it was very oh tedious. Oh my god, that would have killed me. Oh, digital is you know like has blown that out of the water. But it was like, and I had to write down everything they were saying, mm-hmm. and then write voiceover narration, which was very wordy and flowery, which is not the way you want to do voiceover. I, I know now, after you know working in this business, you want short, punchy voiceover narration. I was writing really long, complicated things, but they they were liking it. And the narrator was reading it, and it was they were they were they told me the narrator was having a hard time reading my sentences. That's because I learned I had to learn why it was because they weren't short and punchy enough. But anyway, I ended up writing the first one. They're like, okay, we're going to give you another one. I ended up writing fifteen episodes of the show Intimate Escapes for these people. Wow! And I, it was my first written by credit, which my partner at the time, Ed Horowitz, mm-hmm. he took a picture off the screen and didn't tell me and got it printed out and framed it and gave it to me as a gift. I, I still that's have That's incredible. It. My first rep. Yep. He was so proud of me. That's, a, you know? that's better than a first oh, dollar. I, mean, I, have to, I have to add that. He, my partner at the time was extremely supportive of me and my career and said, if you want to be a writer, then be a writer. He didn't say, don't quit your job, you know, stick to what, you know, he was like, do it. Mm-hmm. So I had that support from you know my significant other at that time, you know. Yeah. I I don't know. If, I would like to believe I would have done it without that if I was single at the time and didn't have someone saying that, or yeah. if he said don't do it. I don't know, but he it was helpful to have a partner who was supporting me, you know. Yeah. And also we were living together, you know. So if, I knew I wasn't going to be like having trouble making the mortgage. Or, you know what I mean? Like, you know yes. what I mean? Uh huh. I never had to rely on him to make the mortgage. I was always able to make enough money to, you know, keep the lights on, as they say, and to support. So he never had to pay my way. But I knew that if worse came to worse, I wouldn't be out on the street. So there was that safety net, right? Yeah. Because I should go back and say that. That's yeah. important. Um, but I ended up doing 15, and that, that launched me as a writer, you know? Mm. And then I got another writing gig, and then another writing gig. And then came Guinness World Records primetime Fox Network show. I got a call. Someone tells me you're a good writer. Like, yeah, I got this show. It's a Fox Network. It's Writers Guild, they said. It's Writers Guild signatory. Mm -hmm. And I said, I didn't say, well, I'm not a member of the Writers Guild. I just said, okay. Right? I didn't didn't say a word. But the minute I hung up, I called the Writers Guild and said, what has to, if I get hired on a writer's guilt show, what has to happen? They're like, oh, nothing. Like, they'll, they'll send a letter to us and let them know that they hired you. You'll have to pay a $2,500 uh, fee. I think it's five grand now, but it was 2500 back in, mm-hmm. in um, 1999 or 98 when that happened, right? And you'll be a member of the writer's guilt. And that's what happened. And I started writing for this because it was Network Fox. That's why it was writer's guilt. Yeah. Everything else I was doing was cable, right? HGTV. History Channel, Learning Channel, those weren't Writers Guild 
signatory. But if you do Fox Network prime time, yeah, you have to be a member of the Writers Guild because Fox signed a contract with the Writers Guild saying we'll use Writers Guild writers for all of our network, all of our stuff. So that's how I got into the Guild, into the Writers Guild, um, by doing which was basically a freak show. I don't know. Do you, do you know the show at all? I don't know. Um, I have it was not... based on the Guinness World Records book. You know what that is. Right? Uh, very familiar. I had several of those books growing up. Um, I probably saw it when I was in school because I know they showed us some Guinness World Record videos. Mm -hmm. um, so I probably did see some of your stuff when I was younger, and I just didn't know it. Well, it was a, it was a freak show. They wouldn't like put on the world's fastest runner. Mm -hmm. They would want the person who has the most prosthetic face pieces, yeah, right? The person that eats the most scorpions. Because there are people that do that as, a, as like a tourist attraction. Was that not you? Well, <laughs> it became me. I became known as the Dark Prince. Oh, of course. They, they knew they could give me anything, and I can make a story about it. They once gave me a minute and 20 seconds worth of footage, and I made a five-minute story out of it. By slow mo, <laughs> slow mo, slowing down the footage, pointing things out, right? Replaying it with different. I yeah, I was known as the Dark Prince of, of Guinness World Record, but that is where I really learned how to make TV because it was my job to write the script, mm -hmm. work with an editor, pick the music, right? Everything like I would shape these little five to ten minute stories with me and the editor. They were my my. And that's where I really really learned how to make television was on Guinness World Records prime time, you know. Because what I was doing on Intimate Escapes was I was sitting at home watching VHS tapes and yeah. making a paper script, right, which was turned over to an editor. But I never met that editor and I never worked with the editor. Yeah. But on this, I was sitting in the edit bay with the editor. And I would hand in my script and then work and then use this shot, use this shot, you, you know. I was I was in control of the of the of the, uh, the whole thing, and that's where I really really learned how to do TV was uh, on uh, Guinness World Records. That was for a company called LMNO Productions. It's not around anymore, but that company was very very good to me. I, I did a lot of things for them. Uh, ended up doing a lot of things for them, and I got a lot. And it got me in the Writers Guild. So you know, I mean, I have good things to say about that company. I, that's all absolutely incredible. And looking at the resume that you sent over to me, I counted 54 different shows that you worked on. Um, I'm not sure how accurate that is, but that's what I counted. Was that in the past two years or my whole career? <laughs> well, not individual episodes <laughs> on each show, but different shows themselves. Right. Um, so with that wealth of experience, what are some of your recommendations for someone who is looking into breaking into the unscripted world or specifically kind of more along the lines of what you do on story producing? Obviously you gave uh, a lot of really helpful tips on how to stand out, you know, not to take specific type of shit from people and uh, trying to give more than what you're asked for if you really want to level up. But for somebody who is just ground level, like wanting to break in, what, what would you say? Right. They should get good at. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier, and you agree that this is a people business. Mm -hmm. Right. So the more people you meet, right, the greater chance that one of those people is going to call you one day and say they're hiring you. Right. Yeah. They're looking for a post producer or a post a, you know, a yeah. runner, a researcher. Right. Sure. They'll say, they'll, We'll get, I'll be working on a show and they'll be like, we're looking for somebody. Do you know anybody? Right? Yes. And I immediately, I, that's a great position to be in in this business. To be able to give someone a job is such a wonderful thing to be able to help someone do. Oh. You know? To put food on their table. You know what I mean? A roof over their head. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to help someone get a job. And I've had the pleasure, people have done it for me, and I've had the pleasure of doing it for other people. You know? Mm -hmm. So... It's true of all of any, uh, I think, uh, entertainment industry, any job, whether it's unscripted or not, it's just the more people you know, um, the, the, the smarter you, you are and the friendlier you are. You know, you need to kind of have to have all those things. You got to be charming. You got to be smart. You got to be a hard worker. You cannot be entitled. You'll get laughed. You'll get, you, you'll, you can't, you can't say I'm better than that. I'm, you know, I, what do you mean? I went to college for four years. I can't run a Xerox machine. You know, like I have a degree. Yeah. You know, type of thing. 
So networking, which I'm horrible at, you know, that's part of it. But just just be a good person. Be a, per, be a person of your word, right? If someone says, okay, hey, can you come over and help me do this thing? Don't get up Saturday and go, oh, I don't feel like it. I'm just going to tell them, uh, you know, go do that thing. Be, a, be that person. It will serve you in all areas of your life as well as, as in the entertainment industry, right? Okay. So that's, that, is, that is the most important thing, I think, of all, you know? Mm-hmm. And also say often, I want to do X. I want to write. I want to be a director. I want to be a cinematographer. I want to be a set designer. Keep saying that to people. And any time you could see that there's a set department, go up to them and say, I'll work for free this weekend. Because they'll never know they need you until you make yourself indispensable to them, right? Until you do that 110% job. And they're like, well, we got to hire this guy. You know what I mean? Oh, let's call that guy. Remember him? He really helped us out. Let's call him back. You know? So it's a lot of the things I've already said, yeah. you know, about, about uh, it's a people business and always doing the best. But also just... M- and you got to learn. That's where the charming comes in, right? I couldn't, I couldn't force James Cameron's uh, development person to read my script, but I could charm her so hard that she would have to read my script. Mm-hmm. I used the resources that I had and used them in, in the best way that I could. Um, so yeah, so that's another one. Now, as far as getting in this business, I uh, again, this is a global entertainment industry note, and it's only become more true th- th- this analogy that I'm going to say. And it's, it's the skyscraper analogy, right? When I got my job on Unsolved Mysteries back in 1988, I didn't realize that I was entering a skyscraper on the bottom level. And the skyscraper was documentary television, right? Mm-hmm. And as I rose up, I was rising up in that skyscraper. I thought that once I became a producer, I could become a producer on a one-hour drama or on a sitcom. I'm a producer now in Hollywood on a hit show. Yeah. No, no. I would have to get all the way back down to the bottom and get out of that skyscraper and then go over to the sitcom skyscraper Mm. and get it on the bottom level there as a writer's assistant. If I wanted to be a writer, right. Mm -hmm. As a post, as a set PA, if I wanted to like, right. Yeah. And then work your way up that, that tower, you know? Yeah. Or the one hour drama tower right yeah okay that's another tower movies is another tower right yeah digital right now that's a new new skyscraper is another tower right yeah you can leap over there are ways you could write an amazing script or make an amazing film on your own that blows people's minds right but that's almost like winning the lottery i mean i don't don't want to say don't do that right yeah but and we and everyone still does that, and everyone still hopes to do that, right? To write that screenplay that's going to get option that Christopher Nolan's going to want to do, and right, and that Tom Cruise is going to want to star in because it's so amazing. But you can leap over. But as far as just like working hard and getting those credits, yeah, they don't transfer over to the other other genres of entertainment, you know. And what I've seen happen in the past like five or ten years is that. Now those skys- there's even more of those skyscrapers. They're, at least in my end of the business, and unscripted. Uh-huh. There's food shows. There's one skyscraper. True crime is another skyscraper. Game shows is another one, right? Yeah. There'll be uh, postings for jobs. If you haven't done a Bravo reality show, don't even bother applying. If you haven't done a food competition show, don't even bother applying. It used to be that if you were a good writer or yeah. a good producer... It didn't matter what the show was about, you know, it doesn't matter. You were good. You were smart, right? Yeah. You knew how to do it. And it's become even more compartmentalized these days where, and because everything, because we're in, in a um, digital world where when they post a job, they get 200 resumes, right? Yeah. 200. The person who has three or four of those credits that they're looking for. Even if I have three, the person who has four is going to get the job, right? Yeah. It's become a numbers game at this point, you know? So it's harder, even harder to like, to just be a good at what you do and expect people to hire you because you're good at what you do, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know how much of what I'm talking about is true with the 
other types of entertainment, but I'm talking about in unscripted, that those skyscrapers are now, not, you're not just an unscripted um, producer. You got to like uh, true crime. Like the job I have now is a true crime show for Oxygen. Yeah. And I got it because they were looking for someone with oxygen credits, right? Oxygen Network. Yeah. And I had two of those, plus Unsolved Mysteries, which is still, that still gets people, you know that show has been off the air. I know it's come back on Netflix. It's still yeah. seen as a premier brand. People still tell me, oh, Unsolved Mysteries. Tell me about Unsolved Mysteries, you know? And um, I probably worked on seven or eight true crime series in over my 35 years. So yeah. I have deep true crime on my resume, but I got the job I'm currently on now because I had the oxygen network. They said oxygen network. And okay. I put oxygen in my cover letter five times or six times. The words true crime and oxygen, right? Yep. And I worked on this true crime show that, that aired on the oxygen network. The other oxygen show, that I did, because you know, they're looking at 200 resumes, right? Yeah. You gotta like, you it's a scream. It you gotta scream. Yeah. You know, it's, subtlety is not gonna get you anywhere, mm -hmm. you know? So, the playing field is very different now than it used to be, you know? Yeah. Um, it used to be that someone would recommend you. Oh, he's a good producer, right? She's a good she's a good writer. And that would be enough, right? It didn't matter what the show was about. If you were a good writer, they'd bring you in, you know? Yeah. But things, things are changed. And that's just because there's so much unscripted content now, right? That sure. it's become, yeah, that's why it's become compartmentalized. Well, David, did I answer your question? It, it absolutely did. And you actually answered another one that I was going to bring up, which was getting jobs when you first got into the industry versus getting jobs now. You also, I was saving that towards the end, but you just answered that, that it is getting even more difficult because people want people with a lot of experience. Right. But keep this in mind, though. There's still tons of shows out there. Oh, yeah. And they're still looking for people, all the staff them all the time. Right. So it's not like there's any less shows. Yes. So even, even if it's a little harder to break through, having that friend call and say, they're hiring on my show, I want to give them your resume, send over your resume, you know, yeah. that's, that's how you get in. So then your number zero rule then, since number one's already taken by Mav, is uh, <laughs> get, get some good friends. <laughs> get good well, friends who you truly enjoy working with and like being around. Be a good person, a smart Pers a person of your word, charming, nice. Don't talk down to people. Don't abuse people that are below you. Is that saying the same people you see on the way up are the same people you see on the way down? You yeah. know, where you might walk into a meeting someday and the kid behind the desk is someone you berated because he didn't get your coffee, right? Yeah. Now or he texted in, you the wrong coffee order. That's what I mean. Yeah. And not, you're sitting there hoping to sell a, a show to this kid, right? Yeah. He's like, oh, I remember you, you know? So just be a, being a good person is, is, and and make those connections and be the type of person that someone will want to want to suggest you for yeah. the show. They know they can count on you that you wouldn't let them down. You know, absolutely. And mm -hmm. so uh, we are way over time, but I think that's justified. Really? Because, oh yes. Oh my God! It flew I, by. No, it it flew. I thought by. we were ten minutes in. We it flew by so quickly, and there are so many other questions that I want to talk to you about. Well, let's so do it again. We are absolutely going to have you back, but I do want to uh, just take uh, two two last minute little things to okay. talk to you about before. And obviously, yes, we are bringing you back because I want to hear more stories about each one of these shows <laughs> you worked on. I want to know more about what truly makes a good writer and story producer in the unscripted world. There's so many things that I'm sure our audience will also want to. Yeah. Um, I like working in unscripted. Yeah. I like it. I enjoy it. It's, yeah. it's, they pay you to learn interesting things, you know, that's a cool way and, to look at it. Yeah. They pay you to like learn a, and meet interesting people. And if you become a film producer, you go to very interesting places. Mm -hmm. You get to see the world. If you work in this, you know, in a way that, yeah, you might go there on a movie set, but it's not the same thing as you like meeting real people in real places yeah. and going into, you know? Yeah. Well, so looking back on this truly just great career that you've had and are still working on, what is one thing that you wish that you had done differently? Mm. Well, that's so hard to say. Because I've had a career for 35 years in that same skyscraper, right? Mm-hmm. That same, it was reality back then, unscripted now. I came to L.A. back in 1987, if you'll remember, your viewers will remember. 
to be a screenwriter, to write movies. Yeah. You know? And I just wonder that if I had held out and for a writer's job on the show, right? Yeah. And not take the Unsolved Mysteries job when it came across, right? I didn't even, again, I didn't even think about it. It was in the entertainment industry. I just said yes. Yeah. Right? And then I just started running down up that skyscraper, up those up those floors. You know what I mean? Like I didn't even think about it, right? That maybe if I had said, no, 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 you want to write, you should try to get a job in a writer's room. You should try to get on a, be a writer's assistant, you know? Because mm -hmm. of, of the friends that moved down to L.A. from San Francisco who got me to move, Mm -hmm. One of them became a huge showrunner. Wow. Huge, huge, huge. ER, uh, I think Madam President with Gina Davis, where she played the president. Um, Melrose Place, just tons and tons of show. And she had no schooling. She had no, she did it writing spec scripts, right? That's incredible. And getting out there, and getting out there, and getting out there. And she was a writer's assistant. Um, I believe it was on uh, Melrose Place, that nighttime soap opera. Uh -huh. I don't know if you know that or not. I'm Melrose actually do, uh, familiar, am familiar yeah. with that because it was my a mom huge show. Yep. Okay, it was a huge show in its time. Yeah, she did it. She broke through with no, no background at all of like film school or anything. And she became a huge showrunner. So it's possible. I often think if I had maybe not taken the unscripted off ramp. Yes. And stuck on the main freeway of what I was here to do. If maybe I would be, it would be a much more expansive room behind you <laughs> and, and not my apartment in West Hollywood, I mean, <laughs> which, I love, it's, which I love. I mean, you which, definitely which have I one love. of the more uh, fabulous and fantastical apartments that I oh, it's like a set. I do it for, just for zooms. It's, it's all, it's all a set. It's all, I mean, that's I, everything. I put all this stuff up right before we started the. Oh, that's some the, dedication the to the podcast. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so then you're working. Did that answer your question? It did. And uh, I think it flows into my last little thing uh, to talk to you about uh, very nicely, which is what's next for David? Oh, man. Well, I have to be honest with you. For the first time in 25 years, I'm writing a screenplay. And it's a big play gas. It's a big sci-fi thriller, just like that first one I wrote back in 1993 or 94. Does this Same one thing. have uh, Air Force One in it? There's a general lack of Air Force One. Good. Okay, so that means it's good. But you know, everything comes back around. 25 years later, maybe it's time to bring Air Force One back in a movie. Yeah, you know? but I, I just don't want to give it to an executive and then they yell at you to get off their plane. <laughs> But yes, I've recently been re-inspired to get back into the screenwriting game, and I'm enjoying it thoroughly. I feel like, you know, I'm much more experienced just as a human being in the world, and I've also seen a lot more movies since the 90s and thought about them in a different way. And I've been writing for 35 years, even though it's not script writing. You're, yeah. you're, it's still structure, you know? And storytelling, especially true crime, that's that's like writing a Agatha Christie who done it. Oh yeah, you know, what clues are you going to set up, and how are they going to pay off at the end? You know, so I'm just really enjoying getting back into the game. I'm a little nervous about it, but I'm I got my my legs back really quick, and it's been really wonderful. So uh, who knows? Who knows? Oh. It's a big. It's but I'm excited about it, and um, I'm happy to be working in what I do. You know, I got a job on a true crime show that I got by being one of 300 people that applied online, like because I wrote that cover letter that used those keywords that they were looking for, right? Yep. And so I'm happy about that, but, you know, I'm excited about just expressing my creativity in, in a broader way, a deeper way. Um, I, I, I found I have a lot I want to say with, with the screenplay uh, format. So I'm excited about getting back on, and I think this, this whatever... Whatever happens to this script, there's going to be one after it, I know. Um, and so I think I've, I've gotten my my mojo, my screenwriting mojo back. So I've always been a late bloomer. So maybe for my 70th birthday, I'll, I'll <laughs> finally sell that script. <laughs> well, David, that is truly wonderful that you still, after all these years, are continuing forward with your passion, which you technically never gave up because you do write TV shows just 
in the unscripted realm. Um, but thank you everybody so much for joining. David, thank you for joining today. If thank you any... for letting let me babble on. <laughs> Always. Well, we have at least like four more episodes with you where you can babble on for, I am sure. Okay. Um, I would but, love to come back. I, uh, I've, I've been to some crazy places and have had some crazy oh, yeah. experiences in this, in this genre. So, well, yeah. even besides the genre, just everything else that I am sure you fill your life with on, uh, just plenty of things would love to pick your brain on for uh, my own curiosity, our viewers curiosity. So if you're listening to this podcast and want to ask David more questions for a future episode, please let me know in the comments below or shoot me an email at ak at a nerdy And uh, thank you all so much for watching and or listening. Uh, please follow along at a nerdy journey everywhere. Um, that is our tag basically on every channel, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, Twitch, Instagram, what have you. So Thank you all, and I will see you on the next one.